Hmm? The power of touching the microphone. I know. Sorry. Two more minutes. Continue talking amongst yourselves. <laughs> Please feel free to take pictures and tweet before we start using the hashtag CeaseMcMafia. Yes, please. Thank you. It is yours. No, no. but it looks impressive, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Wow, quite a bit of keys. Ben, Thank you. are these yours? No. Maybe it's Mark's. Claudia? They're not mine. These are the keys. Yours. Let's have them. <laughs> Um, Mark. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reading from this, but I rarely do. Usually, I just sort of make it up on the spot. So. I thought but he has no oh, new gloves. So. You think it's your gloves? Might have been no. Or oh, maybe he didn't use no. it. All right. So, okay, I'll have that. Okay. Okay. We've worn them and we'll warn them again. Well, I suppose they could sort of focus on a narrow tranche. <laughs> trying to move into the centre. <laughs> Claudia, are we good to go? Great. Welcome, everybody. I think we're ready to start now. Uh, welcome to this evening's event, McMafia The Reality, uh, which is being co-hosted by the post-Soviet Press Group and the Center for Russian Studies at UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies. My name is Ben Noble. I'm lecturer in Russian politics at CIS. I'm going to be chairing the event this evening. Uh, the topicality of this evening's event uh, doesn't really need to be explained. From the statement last week from the security minister, Ben Wallace, that so-called oligarchs from Russia will be required to explain the sources of their wealth, to Boris Titov, the Russian presidential commissioner for entrepreneurs' rights, meeting in London over the weekend with Russian businessmen to discuss options for their return to Russia, it's sometimes tricky to work out whether art is imitating life or life is imitating art. The aim of this evening's event is to give academics with research interests in the topics raised by McMafia an opportunity to engage with and comment on the series and the issues that it addresses. Before we get started, I have to go through a few housekeeping points. 
Firstly, the Twitter hashtag for this event is Cease McMafia. Uh, please make sure to get right the number of S's and E's, and preferably get them in the right order, in order for the hashtag to work. Secondly, this event is being filmed and live streamed. This means that you might appear, albeit briefly, in the footage and any resulting marketing materials it may be used for. If any of you have any concerns about that, please approach a member of Cease staff at the end of the event. Thirdly, please make sure all of your electronic devices are in silent mode. Uh, and finally, this is a spoiler alert. Uh, plot details will be discussed this evening. So those of you who haven't watched the seventh episode yet, um, we can't promise uh, not to tell you that Natasha dies. Um, <clears throat> oh, groans, hardly. Right. I'm very pleased to introduce the four panelists this evening. Uh, firstly... Dr. Mark Galliotti, a senior research fellow at the Institute of International Relations in Prague. Mark has held posts at various academic institutions around the world, including LSE, Kiel University, and NYU. His forthcoming book, The Vori, Russia's Super Mafia, will be released by Yale University Press on the 10th of April, even though there it's written, uh, it's the 20th of April. Uh, secondly, we have Dr. Philippa Hetherington. Philippa is lecturer in modern Eurasian history at CIS. Uh, Philippa's research centers around the cultural, social, and legal histories of Imperial Russia and the early Soviet Union in global and transnational contexts. On the 16th and 17th of this month, Philippa will be leading a workshop and a roundtable exploring the history of Russia's relationship with international law. Thirdly, we have Professor Eliana Ledinova. Eliana is Professor of Politics and Society at CIS. Many of you will know Eliana's books, including Russia's Economy of Favors, How Russia Really Works, and Can Russia Modernize? UCL Press has just published her two-volume Global Encyclopedia of Informality, which she edited. Last but not least, we have Dr. Alexander Kupatadze, Alexander is lecturer at the Russia Institute at KCL, uh, our rivals. Uh, Alexander's first book uh, was titled Organized Crime, Political Transitions and State Formation in Post-Soviet Eurasia, and that was published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2012. In 2017, he published an article in the journal Crime, Law and Social Change on corruption in the Baltics and the Caucasus. Those of you who want to explore some of the issues discussed this evening in more detail might be interested in the publication of another book uh, called The New Autocracy, Information, Politics, and Policy in Putin's Russia, edited by Dan Treisman. That book includes chapters on the Russian security service and the influence of Russian business people on the Kremlin, and also includes a chapter by me on the state Duma. So, on to the practicalities of the panel discussion. Each panelist will speak for around 10 to 15 minutes. We'll then open the session up to questions. Uh, that will be a combination of questions from the floor, but also questions that are uh, presented through Twitter. If you would like to ask a question through Twitter, but you're in this room, um, that's absolutely fine. Please be sure to use the hashtag, Cease McMafia. Um, uh, for those of you that would prefer to ask a question uh, uh, live, so to speak, uh, we will send around roving mics. Uh, please make sure when you ask your question, you begin by giving a brief summary of who you are. Uh, we have this room until 9 o'clock, uh, which should give us plenty of time for questions. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark. Well, thanks very much, and hello. Delighted to be here, uh, and not just to plug my book. Though it is a very, very good book, I should add. Um, while I'm in the sort of the, the middle of basically blowing my own horn, let me actually say that I gave Misha Glennie the title McMafia. Um, and if you read his book, you will see that I'm actually cited, so I'm not just inventing this. It was over a long, boozy dinner um, in Oxford, and I was talking about how Chechen organized crime within Russia um, the Chechens being a, a small, fractious, and frankly hard as nails um, ethnic grouping from the southwest uh, of Russia. Um, how they had, in effect, created a criminal franchise. The point was this whenever you talk to Russian cops, time and again they would say, oh, you know, most of organized crime, it's, it's, it's the people from the Caucasus, it's, it's foreigners, it's not, not our Russian boys. Of course, that's absolute nonsense. 
the majority of Russian organized crime is ethnically Russian, but it's always nice to be able to blame the outsider. But then I was actually talking to one guy from a Siberian town who said, yeah, we've got a real problem with, with Chechen organized crime. And I was thinking, I, I'm surprised there's that many Chechens where you are. So I, I looked into it, and what it became clear was, in fact, the local Chechen gang, quote unquote, was not. It had a few Dagestanis, one, one Avar, which is another sort of uh, North Caucasus uh, nationality. But most of them were, were Russians. But the point is that the Chechens had accumulated an amazingly powerful brand name. Essentially, everyone knows that you do not mess with the Chechens. Um, you don't mess with most organized crime groups, but that the Chechens had this reputation of being people who, if you cross them, they will come back at you. They will not be reasonable. That was actually how one, one, one cop put it. They are not reasonable gangsters. You know, they will summon their friends and their brothers and their cousins and they will keep coming at you until they have torn you down. And so, in the main, when the Chechens come along and they, they want to you know, demand protection money from you, it makes good sense to pay. Now, when you've got this formidable brand name, why not make use of it? Why not allow, in areas where there aren't Chechen gangs, others who are willing to, in a way, effectively play by the Chechen rules and are willing to essentially pay a tithe to the local nearest Chechen godfather to basically take over the franchise? Now, Misha then took it to, to use as the basis for a, you know, a much broader and, and, and fascinating book. Um, but the thing is, what really that strikes me is the extent to which we sometimes omit to understand the extent to which modern economic concepts and, and anyway, effectively, the, the, the logic of the market dominates organized crime. The, the series itself jumps around in a sometimes slightly confusing way um, from all sorts of different countries. But that, in many ways, represents quite accurately the way that organized crime has become a transnational market. Even the smallest, least organized, least impressive gang. Three kids called Darren in hoodies, hanging around in some street corner, selling a few E's and maybe a little bit of cocaine, are actually part of a transnational economy. The drugs they're selling have probably been imported. The money that they will be kicking back to their eventual supplier is probably laundered through 15 different national jurisdictions. Just as we may not look at a little corner shop and think of it as part of global economic structures, they all are. And the Russians, I think, have been very much at the forefront of this. And in part, it's precisely because they have a very, very um, business model of their operations. Um, I was once uh, sh had shared with me transcripts from a European police force who had been um, intercepting the cell phone conversations of some gangsters, some Russian gangsters, uh, operating in their country. And I was thinking, wow, this is going to be cool. This is like you know, a soap opera, ready for me. And it wasn't. I felt so robbed. It was so dull. <laughs> and I swear that at one point, one of them said, we really have to consider the vertical integration of our supply chain. <laughs> now. This was not why I got into studying organized crime. Trust me. Um, but then when I was talking to some analysts from that service afterwards, and we were trying to kind of piece together how this, this grouping worked, now they kept sort of drawing on, on their whiteboard the classic kind of pyramid. That's what they wanted to find. You know the classic pyramid with a godfather at the top, and then captains and lieutenants, and um, you know, foot soldiers at the bottom. And I kept saying, look, guys, this is not how it works. In this particular operation, this guy is dominant because he basically had the idea, but that does not mean he has sort of wider social power over the others. It's a flat network. And again, time and time again, they were trying to crowbar it into the sort of model which we know from Godfather films and such like. And eventually, one of the analysts kind of threw his hands up in, in disgust and said, this isn't an organized crime group. It's a bunch of Facebook friends. <laughs> and in a way, he was right, because welcome to the modern underworld. There are, of course, lots and lots of gangs, but they are in some ways the nodes within these huge criminal transnational networks. And although looking at the gangs is fun, 
you know, they have all kinds of characters in their thing, the, the Russian hard men with their tattoos that we all see in the films, um, and, and many others, you know, the, the, the Italians are still around, some, one area, they may not be good at rugby, but I'm going to cry and they're very good at it. Um, you know, but nonetheless, in some ways, that is a distraction from this wider issue. So why is it that the Russians have proven to be so effective in this global marketplace for criminal goods and services? Because they are. Um, I mean, unless there's some sort of, I don't know, iceberg um, rackets going on. I think probably Antarctica is about the only continent in the world in which there are not serious organized crime Russian networks operating. You'll find them in so many different circumstances and in so many different trades as well. Whether it's um, massive multi-million dollar Medicare medical insurance frauds in the United States, whether it's swapping Afghan heroin for Latin American cocaine um, for then resale in Europe. The overwhelming majority of global heroin comes from Afghanistan. Yeah, we've achieved something. Um, and about a third of that and rising now comes through Russia. And some of that is actually now begin, beginning to go to China. They are sort of exploring that, that particular brave new world. Whether it's in terms of weapons and um, counterfeit goods that you'll find in Africa. I mean, wherever you're looking, there will be a Russian footprint. So why? Why is it that they are so global, so networked, in some ways so kind of postmodern, post-industrial in their structures? Well. Part of it is because in the 1990s, when they really emerged, there was pressure to get the hell out of Russia, or at least get your money out of Russia. Back in the 1990s, um, there was a, a belief, a fear, that it was possible that the communists or some kind of fascistic regime or whatever could take power. And so there was a great pressure, not just from the, from the criminals, precisely to move their money out where it would be safe. So there was pressure. But more to the point, this was happening at a time when in Russia itself, the boundaries between business, crime, and politics were particularly, I wouldn't even say fluid, often just simply imperceptible. I'm not saying it's that different now, but it is a bit different. This was a time when Russia was busy trying desperately to redefine itself. I mean, for me, the most fascinating example was the fact that it had become a capitalist country. And yet, it took years for them to take the law on speculation off the statute books. Now, speculation was defined as the unauthorized trade in goods and services for personal gain, which sounds to me pretty much like capitalism. So this was a capitalist country which for years actually had a law on the statute book saying capitalism is illegal. You know, perhaps no wonder that this was such a confused time and that many of the concepts of what is capitalism just simply meant it's making money regardless. These are business people. When one looks, oh actually no, I mean in fairness, almost invariably businessmen, this is still very much a, sort of a, a male dominated area. And when one looks nowadays at the key figures within Russian organized crime, the sorts of figures whom we, we, we're seeing in the TV program, Precisely, they are not the tattooed leg breakers. They hire those people. No, they are businessmen. They are people in nice suits. They are people who have a whole portfolio of interests from the essentially legitimate to the slightly gray, you know, maybe a perfectly you know, reasonable, you know, normal shop, but just happens to sell some counterfeit goods to the absolutely illegal, the heroin trafficking, the people trafficking, and so forth. It's all just business. Um, and this is why they have been not just the kind of early adopters, but in I think they have realized something about modern capitalism, which is precisely that it actually has outgrown many of the legal boundaries of the old order. Now, to sort of bring together, so what happened is in the 1990s, the Russian mafia kind of crashed out of the country like would-be conquistadors, particularly into Central and Eastern Europe. And in the short term, it looked as if no one could stand in their way. They had men, they had money, they had guns, and they had a willingness to use them with little to lose. 
Um, there was one particular British chief constable who said that by the year 2000, the biggest security threat within Russia will be, sorry, within Britain, will be Russian organized crime gangs. Well, that hasn't happened. Why? Well, because in country after country, their initial successes soon turn to reversals. Actually, something which unfortunately Federico Varese, who's an excellent scholar of the Russian Mafia who couldn't be with us today, um, has demonstrated that on the whole, mafias do not migrate. They might be pushed, but they don't actually tend to occupy new territory. In country after country, essentially the Russians were, were tamed or beaten back. So they came out again in the, in the noughts, but not as conquerors, as merchant adventurers, as service providers. Talking to the criminals of Europe and beyond, what do you want? What do you need? Because we can probably get it for you. You want drugs? We've got heroin. We can swap that heroin for other things. There are um, chemical labs around St. Petersburg that can produce all kinds of great methamphetamines. What do you want? We can provide it. You want hackers? We've got hackers. You want killers? We've got killers too. So time and time again, what has happened is actually the Russian criminals have emerged in this second wave internationally precisely as the wholesalers, the one-stop shop for everyone else's gangsters. When one looks at Russian criminality in Europe in particular, but also beyond, we're not finding a lot of Russians on the streets selling drugs, um, you know, intimidating women and forcing them into prostitution. No, they're operating on the wholesale end. And then they sell on to the locals. And part of that is also laundering money, investing money, and so forth. So they are the service providers for the global underworld now. And, and again, I think this is something that comes up with this kind of blending of upper world legal business and so forth with uh, outright criminality in the, in the TV series. We are the service providers to the criminal service providers. Whether it's the money laundering that goes through the city of London. Turn up with a suitcase full of cocaine spattered um, 100 euro bills and they'll call the police. If you've had the courtesy to pre-wash it, bounce it through Latvia, Cyprus, Israel, Turks and Caicos, then come to the city of London, oh, then, it's, then it's just business. Buying condos in Trump Tower, I don't believe the whole kind of collusion stories. I think Trump's too dumb and the Russians were too clever. Um, but what I think it, the story does show is that actually if you're an iffy businessman, whose business is basically a pyramid scheme that desperately needs more investors. You can always find that in Russia, in Central Asia, and, and indeed beyond. People who will actually buy your, your chintzy, glitzy apartments just simply as a way of moving money legitimately into the United States and therefore moving it into the legitimate sector. More generally, whether it's you know, from, from Israel to Latvia, from Canberra to California, what we find are, is that Legitimate business is increasingly, I would suggest, um, willing to accept the advantages of being connected at arm's length with global criminality. And the people who absolutely are at the forefront of that are our friends, the Russians. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I think straight on to Philippa. Yeah, should I take this one? Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone for turning out uh, this evening. So I'm, um, as Ben has already announced, I'm a historian. Uh, and so I'll be the kind of odd one out on the panel in that I'm coming from obviously a historical perspective. I also may end up being the odd one out on the panel in that I'm you know, injecting maybe a hint of skepticism or maybe a pretty large chunk of skepticism about some of the kinds of narratives certainly that we get from um, from McMafia which I think a historical perspective can kind of help to bring uh, a sort of slightly skeptical view uh, to what they present us so what I actually work on is the history of uh, trafficking in women um, from late Imperial Russia and the early Soviet Union so one particular manifestation of what was perceived as, at the time, as a transnational crime, just as it is um, today. Uh, and I look at uh, the huge amount of anxiety and concern about trafficking in Russian subject women um, that arose in the late 19th century. 
I look at how you know, people talked about this in Russia and internationally at the time. I look at um, how the Russian state was involved in the first um, attempts to create an international legal structure to combat trafficking and also in the first attempts to organize uh, international police cooperation. So for example, the beginnings of Interpol. Uh, and I also look at what actually happened to women who were identified abroad as having been Russian victims of trafficking. So what, you know, what kinds of stories came out uh, from what they said about what had happened to them and uh, how were uh, they treated by Russian consular officials, by the international anti-trafficking community afterwards. Um, so it often surprises people uh, to learn that 100 years ago, or slightly more than 100 years ago, there was just as much concern about trafficking in women, sex trafficking, um, as there is today, arguably maybe even more. It was seen as a huge uh, sort of global social problem. Um, Russia was seen as, um, or the Russian Empire at the time, was seen as the main source region for the global traffic um, in women just as it came to be seen um, again in the 1990s, or the, uh, the post-Soviet space in that case. Um, and the narrative uh, that people had at the time about what happened, um, you know, why trafficking was such an endemic problem, was that uh, traffickers from the Russian Empire, who were usually coded in the Russian discussion as Jewish, um, <laughs> Jewish traffickers were um, kidnapping blonde Slavic uh, women, um, and then forcing them into prostitution abroad, especially in the Ottoman Empire, so in um, what, you know, what we would now call the Middle East. Um, when you actually look at what happened, you see that uh, this was actually very rarely the case. Um, very few of the women who uh, consular officials and police identified in prostitution abroad who were Russian subject women, um, very few of them appeared to have been uh, kidnapped or drugged or necessarily forced into this. They may have been exploited um, in uh, sex work in uh, the Ottoman Empire, but it didn't usually fit the kind of traditional story that people were reporting in newspapers at the time, that people were talking about at international anti-trafficking uh, congresses. Um, so fast forward to today. Uh, now, as all of you would know, uh, there's a lot of discussion still about sex trafficking as a kind of endemic problem. Nowadays, it often gets called modern slavery, but it often fits many of the same kinds of tropes that we had 100 years ago, or perception of those tropes. So when I'm watching McMafia, uh, which I will premise by saying, uh, sorry, preface by saying, um, I you have watched it and I have enjoyed it, so I'm gonna be quite critical of it, but I just wanna say in advance, you know, it's not that I'm also not sitting in my pajamas on a Sunday night you know, uh, consuming this. Um, so when I watch McMafia, it comes to the second episode, what do I see? I see a story in which um, some Russian background traffickers, actually Jewish uh, as well, and that comes to a point I might make in a moment about some problematic um, aspects of the narrative. So Russian background traffickers, forcing a blonde Slavic woman, woman sorry, into prostitution in the Middle East. So exactly the same narrative, actually, that we had 100 years ago, and that 100 years ago seems to have been uh, not closely connected to things that were actually going on um, on the ground. Now, in the early, late 19th century, early 20th century in Russia, if we look at what kind of political work did this narrative of trafficking do, and that's one of the things that I try and do in my book, um, we can see, first of all, how it pretty easily feeds into um, anti-Semitic stereotypes that were very common at the time about Jewish criminality. So all the discussions about trafficking are about how it's, it's Jewish um, men who are trafficking Slavic women. Um, when you actually look at what the police found when they talked to women in prostitution abroad, that was not the case. The other thing, of course, it was very relevant that these women were being trafficked to the Ottoman Empire. The Russian Empire being involved in internecine wars against the Ottoman Empire, um, and it fed into a certain kind of stereotype of the Turk as, uh, you know, patriarchal, abusive, um, uh, you know, kidnapping these Russian women. So you can understand then why I might have some skepticism when I see this narrative recapitulated for me um, on the television on Sunday night. And I think that although you know, this relates specifically to the trafficking angle of uh, McMafia. It does, for me, raise certain questions more broadly about the kinds of cultural, ethnicized, and really kind of racialized stereotypes that they are trafficking uh, in. Um, I think it's not necessarily irrelevant that 
Uh, they present the Russian organized criminals as Jewish on the show. Um, this is something that has been criticized by representatives of the Jewish community, and I think that's a fair criticism. They haven't really come up with any good reasons why um, that's the case, and it's somewhat problematic given this long cultural stereotype of Jewish criminality, which is a highly um, corrosive one. Um, and again, I think that you know, if we look at um, the kind of political work that the, the kind of narratives in the show are doing, presenting organized crime as something that's imported from the outside into Britain as something that's entirely run by uh, dangerous and nefarious foreigners who have links to other places we might be scared of, like Egypt. Um, if we look at the person who's presented as a victim in this situation, again, Ludmila, the, um, the, blonde, um, the blonde woman, you can see how all sorts of nuances maybe about how the sex industry works, about how migratory prostitution works, are being erased from this narrative and they're being replaced by a set of stereotypes which e easily feed into ideas that people already have about Russians, about uh, the Middle East, etc. Um, and I think, you know, where does that get us then? Um, I think television shows, you know, TV is TV. And of course, we often, we all know, we're often fed sensationalistic stereotypes in TV shows that we watch, which some of which may bear some connection to um, real world, uh, you know, political, social problems. And again, none of this is to say that there is not a problem with organized crime, that Russians aren't sometimes involved in it, and all the rest of it. I'm just saying that it raises for us our need to kind of keep our critical hats on when we consume this kind of media. What bothered me, I think, the most about McMafia was not so much the fact that um, these narratives were present in the show, because I'm a person in the world who consumes popular culture, so I know we get fed all sorts of sensationalistic things that aren't necessarily, quote unquote, the truth. It's the fact that it, was, it started to be talked about in the media as if this was the truth. So I wrote down some examples of um, uh, media headlines. So just from two days ago, we had a column in the, the Telegraph which said, quote, McMafia is a documentary, not a drama. We need to pay far closer attention to Russian activity in the city. We, all, we also had, as Ben has already pointed out, the security min, uh, minister, Ben Wallace, saying that McMafia was, quote, very close to the truth and saying that, you know, we need to therefore keep a closer eye on the Russians. And I mean, bearing in mind that you know, we are living in the context of Russiagate and all the rest of it going on in the US. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons people are coming up with why we need to keep a closer watch on the Russians. So when suddenly we're fed a kind of popular culture narrative that feeds into that, I think we just need to kind of keep our thinking hats on. Um, in an interview with The Guardian, the director of McMafia called it, quote, a state of the nation treatise on globalization. And again, I sort of was just thinking, you know, as someone who studies globalization in historical context and the ways in which, you know, sort of underground economies of globalization developed um, historically, I just don't think that what I'm consuming on Sunday night is actually, you know, a state of the nation treatise on globalization. Um, I think that in general, narratives that feed us the idea that it's foreigners who are bringing problems uh, to us, that they're somehow not indigenous um, to where we are, again, uh, somewhat problematic. I've seen discussion in the, um, in the news this week about, which is also linked to discussions about Russian oligarchs, uh, to the fact that there's a lot of property sitting empty in London. This idea that very rich people from abroad are buying up this property and then leaving it empty, that may well be true, but the solution that we're given is maybe the government needs to start making it harder for foreign people to buy property. Um, I'm a foreign person, I'm not British, I live and work in London, actually I live in Oxford because I can't afford to live in London, but I work in, in London. Uh, one day I would like to be able to afford to live in London and maybe one day I would like to buy property. Um, I don't love hearing narratives about how it would be really great to make it harder for foreigners uh, to buy property and I don't love uh, seeing the ways in which somehow these things all get um, conflated together. Uh, you know. Russians traffic women to the Middle East, therefore we should stop foreigners from buying property. I think there are better ways for us to come up with solutions for these problems than laying them at the door. So that's essentially my plug for why I think McMafia is problematic uh, and why I think a historical perspective on, us, on it can help us to see and um, see some of the problems and also can remind us that historically when all of the problems of, say, uh, you know, in the case of what I study, trafficking in women, but in general, organized crime, criminality, social problems, when they're all laid at the door of one or other particular foreign group, uh, it doesn't 
exactly work out very well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I would like to start with a question. How many people in the audience actually watched the movie? Movie? TV series. <laughs> uh, TV, we. <laughs> I just tried to use one word instead of two for <laughs> briefness, but as you corrected me. Sorry. Um, what I would like to say is that I had a chat before the coming here with a lot of experts, and um, no one loves it, but everyone watches it. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of already produces a certain tension in how people really are critical, especially academic experts. You know, it's our job to be critical. And I think Philippa here has done an excellent job in sort of criticizing um, the narrative. And I agree with her wholeheartedly that, you know, there is so much about it that is cliche that I don't even know what we are doing here at this panel. However, <laughs> however, Media does an amazing thing. You know, they communicate something effectively. And of course, they could not communicate complexity because then we would not watch it. You know, it's like you have time for Twitter, you don't have time for a long email. Same thing. You have time for something entertaining. You wouldn't read Mark's book from cover to cover, although some of us really would because it's an excellent book. And it's very entertaining. <laughs> now what I wanted to say maybe just for a starters is to give you, you know, a brief idea as to what I see in it with an emphasis on what I like about it. Because I think it's um, very easy for us to just um, criticize it. Now, what I see, first of all, is this kind of tension of the globalization message. You know, we see global operations of what Alex does. At the same time, we say globali globalizing mafia doesn't work, mafia doesn't travel, and we still call it Russians. But look at it closely. He talks to a Mexican. He goes to Prague, he has a lot of international partners. You will see even more of that in the seventh episode. So you kind of um, really wonder, why is it that we are referring to it as Russians? And I have a confession to make. I'm a Russian. So I feel a bit um, taken by that kind of label, because what I see, okay, uh, some people there are of Russian origin, but um, they have very little to do with an average Russian as I know it. Now, having said that, what, another thing that strikes me in, in the view of globalization that although it's transnational, there is a categorical disjunction with the way in which we control and provide accountability for these activities, which are all occurring on national level. So we've got a complete mismatch of how we think about controlling it as a matter of national policy and the transnational nature of the beast. Um, you could see, for example, in the movie very interestingly how UK police would be very happy to hear Rebecca's lie that she just stopped loving Alex, therefore she moved out. And that sort of convenient for police state would close the investigation so they wouldn't engage. That is also a very interesting uh, feature of this series is that it's a London-based drama. Did you remember any British character in it? No. And that is really, who? Rebecca, is she British though? I thought she was American, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of have this interesting, you know, slants of narrative um, for sure. 
But um, that kind of disjunction is so striking in the movie that I hope that the initiative that actually was taken under David Cameron with a V uh, of uh, G20 and anti-corruption, anti-crime um, policies that would become transnational would actually see some continuation because that's where the main problem is. The second point I wanted to make is about KGB and the political roof of the organized crime, which is very important um, story that may be not obvious for someone who doesn't remember that actually when Putin came to power, the first thing he did is getting rid of Chechen mafia and replacing it with Siloviki or KGB driven type of control. And that created a certain kind of order, a control type of um, management and the divide and rule type of policy where you have to have a clearance with your political roof as to whether you could eliminate certain tribe on the criminal scene. And that I think was portrayed very well. And it's something that um, I think rings the bell in the sense that there is a reason why we talk about mafia state or political rule for the criminal activities because obviously um, for KGB um, having what Max Weber calls the monopoly of legitimate violence would really be foolish not to take advantage of the illicit financial flows, which they pretty much do by trying to direct the informal illegal type of capital towards the pocket where um, it belongs in their view. So that kind of monopoly of legitimate violence is quite an interesting concept, and I recommend um, the books by, by Dim Volkov uh, on violent entrepreneurship, uh, which is effectively what is shown in, in, in this um, series, and also the, the book um, by um, Federico Varese, and also an edited volume by Mark Galeotti about uh, Soviet and post-Soviet organized crime. But what um, I would say very, very briefly is that there is a reason for Chechens to have that brand. And the reason is actually explained very well by Vadim in the um, seventh episode. And my memory is so short, I only remember the last one. But what he said is that you really have to give away everything if you want to be um, a mafia boss, uh, including your family, including your life. And you should be doing and ready to do it on the spot. And that's what creates that kind of aura of atmarozek, or you know, someone who is off the radar, someone who could kill, shoot, not being scared. And that kind of fearlessness, it actually creates a certain kind of status um, that, would, um, that could be called a symbolic capital, if we are talking Pierre Bourdieu here. And that symbolic capital is actually reproducing itself. And that violence is really is essential, the one that is also has um, an extraordinary um, demand. Now, political roofs is a very interesting topic, which is not touched upon in detail in this series. Just as many other interesting themes, such as, for example, the one on, of legal corruption. I don't know if you remember, I think it was in the first episode, where Alex decides, okay, he will take the investment, but take it through a series of offshores so that the identity of the investor would be hidden. And it was shown in a movie in a kind of quick sort of um, clumsy way where you could sense that something illegal is going on, something unethical anyway. But the truth is, everything that was happening was totally legal. It was unethical, but it was totally legal. Besides, UK has got that offshore zones under their jurisdiction. In fact, British lawyers are feeding off those type of transactions on a daily basis. They are not in the movie. So um, if we were 
doing some kind of offshore, you know, series here, we would all fall asleep because it's technical. And of course, they showed it very lightly and quickly. But let me tell you something, the subject of legal corruption is becoming truly central in um, anti-corruption studies because it's something that we are not equipped to deal with, just as controlling transnational crime on a national level. And that's a number two issue. Um, number three, actually, because number two was dealing with political rules that we don't really have access and which are also portrayed quite abstractly in the movie as Remember that lady who was sitting in the seventh episode in some kind of department who was controlling the friend of Vadim and somehow she felt she had an air of authority and you just think, hmm, I wonder, you know, which surname do you have? Are you on that Kremlin list that has been released? I'm sure she isn't. Because, you know, that kind of KGB jurisdictions or governance agency, or that kind of competition that takes place. It's very badly accounted for. I mean, inclusive of the experts who have no sort of direct access to, to these people, apart from Mark, that I have to say. Um, so finally, um, my final point um, would be about ethnography. And doing an ethnographic research myself, I thought that the movie was really well done, in the sense that, first of all, they invited Russian actors. I thought it was a real hit because, you know, they're really doing fantastic job. And I don't know who is your favorite, but we could vote in the end. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I quite like, um, you know, a few, but um, <laughs> the ethnography um, is very interesting on a number of levels. The first point that I continuously see as a recurrent theme is a clash of formal and informal constraints. It's almost like professional code of an investment banker. Comes across loyalties to the family. The need to protect your family and yourself comes across certain kind of business transactions that you might be um, wanting to engage in. So you've got this clashing situation where all of a sudden you could be put in a position where you have really big choices to make, which was the case of Alex. And I thought he portrays that tension very well in, term, in terms of acting as well. And that tension is not only for him, it's also for Vadim who cares about his daughter, but he also cannot help himself because he comes from Afghan um, background and it's very hard to be humiliated. So he, when he received the message from the top that he has to uh, stop the revenge and he has to accept what's going on. Um, you could see that, you know, his kind of um, military past would not let him go. And it shows that kind of traps that all of those people um, live with. You also have to see um, how interestingly they portray the code, you know, Panyatia. Um, the code where, um, you know, you could not only uh, transfer secret messages through passing a code or observing the code <laughs> of honor or knowing that you have to revenge for certain things but not for the others. Um, it's a very interesting exploration of that topic because if you sort of re-watch episodes looking at um, how that codes really work, it's very interesting. Another topic that comes from the encyclopedia, actually volume two, I was looking at it today, strategies of survival and strategies of gaming the system. What um, I picked on what Alex said um, last Sunday, he said, you know, I am a broker, but I'm a broker for survival. And it's interesting how you define survival and how it's really is um, about brokerage for getting a competitive advantage or getting just a level field with someone else. So all those practices of negotiating, mediating, and strategizing include a whole underbelly of informal practices that are absolutely essential for the operations of the mafia. And I think without understanding how they work, 
we could not really control it. And in many ways, if we were able to amend the code, transfer the code into something else, it would stop working the way it was. And I'm going to stop here. Well, what I'm going to say flows very nicely from what just um, Aliona summarized. Uh, so first, let me uh, say a few things about this global dimension, this transnational uh, condition uh, of organized crime. Um, I think McMafia is just kind of realistic picture on the one hand, um, because it shows that Moscow-based criminal structure, they uh, collaborate uh, with Prague-based criminal structure as well as Mumbai-based criminal structure. So it's not as in some writings, um, kind of Hydra type um, international uh, network that controls um, all um, chain of operation and, and is, uh, functions in numerous jurisdictions. Um, and also it does not um, tell us that um, uh, mafias um, migrate um, completely. It's not a plant that can be just uh, transplanted in different environments. Um, it's more kind of continuous loop. That is, um, um, they keep, um, uh, they keep uh, in touch with their home environment. Um, so I think th this is quite, quite close um, um, uh, to what we know, uh, how uh, transnational crime functions. If you look at drug smuggling, for example, um, in, in Central Asia, um, it's never done by a single actor. It's usually collaboration between different districts or, or national structures. Uh, this is not a single group um, uh, that can carry heroin from Afghanistan all the way to Moscow. No, it's um, a collaboration between uh, Tajiks and Kyrgyz, with Kazakhs and with Russians. Um, and um, I think this is uh, um, a very um, uh, important aspect of this. Um, also, um, uh, I mean, as Mark said, Russian organized crime is global service providers. Um, in, in they, they are, um, according to Mac Mafia, they can be involved in many different types of activity. Uh, that is uh, trafficking of human beings, uh, drug smuggling, uh, organizing counterfeit industry. Um, uh, but uh, often it can be uh, organized in, in, in another way. Uh, in one of the episodes, um, Vadim Galyagin, he sees the petty traders in the streets rounded up by the police. Um, and then he asks the question, are these our people? Um, and, and he gets the answer that yes, these are uh, parts of um, this counterfeit industry that is organized by a criminal network. Uh, but often this is not um, true, right? And the petty trade uh, in the streets um, uh, is not often related with the um, uh, criminal structure uh, that controls uh, smuggling or production of, of, of these um, uh, counterfeit goods. Um, I, I was uh, less uh, convinced about this division um, between political roofs and, and organized crime. Um, uh, I mean, I, I have never done research inside the Russia. I've been looking across the cases in Caucasus, Central Asia, and many of the patterns are, are replicated. Uh, but often, um, uh, the state-affiliated individuals, they are not just peripheral actors. They, they are not only the people who provide protection and who accept bribe um, in exchange of protection. They, they are pretty much complicit themselves. They, they are playing a central role in this. Uh, just two years ago, there was a case of assassination of um, one of the um, largest drug traffickers um, uh, from Central Asia who uh, took shelter in Belarus, in Minsk. And then he was killed um, um, in, 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 in Minsk. Um, and, and uh, there's all uh, circumstantial uh, evidence that is, of course, difficult to prove in, in the courts because it's, it's impossible uh, to do it um, just because of these corruption um, components of it. But uh, there's all evidence that indicates uh, that um, uh, the, the guy who killed him is one of the highest ranking uh, law enforcement officials in, in one of the Central Asian countries. Um, and, and it's not that he provides protection of a underground network um, um, and, and uh, kind of profits from it. No, it, he, he, uh, he's uh, the leader of, of the uh, organized crime uh, network uh, himself. 
Um, so I think overall um, it's unfair to show uh, that the role of corrupt officials um, uh, is, is peripheral. Um, they, they can uh, be quite, um, they can be playing quite central role in organizing all this. Um, and, 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 and the last point is uh, about violence. Um, uh, the Mac Mafia shows that uh, organized crime um, uh, is using violence uh, uh, widely. Um, um, and and, and the, uh, what, what we know suggests otherwise. We, we, we know that uh, much of the organized crime uh, kind of became legal at the end of the 90s and especially in the 2000s. Uh, since they are now legal businessmen, they, um, uh, they prefer to solve things um, uh, without violence. Um, um, they depend on the, on the legal system much more than they depended uh, before. Um, just a, uh, a few weeks ago, I was looking at one of the cases in one of the Central Asian countries when um, a organized crime network was extorting um, an entrepreneur and the um, entrepreneur um, offered his um, luxurious car uh, as, as, as a fee. And the first thing this organized crime did was that they went um, to public registry to check if they could um, legally uh, get ownership of, of this car. Um, and, and of course we all know um, the cases of litigation um, um, that sometimes is happening in, in London, uh, London arbitrage courts, uh, when um, former um, uh, collaborators in business, um, uh, they, they fall out with each other, and uh, in order to prove their case, they give up dirt about themselves. So um, one of the Russian oligarchs, he directly said uh, that um, um, criminal X uh, was not his partner in business, he was just a protector of his business. Um, uh, so they depend on, on the legal system much more, and uh, they um, often prefer to um, solve issues um, more peacefully than, than uh, it's often uh, suggested. Um, one, one of the reasons why, um, going back to drug smuggling, why drug smuggling in Central Asia is so peaceful uh, compared to what's happening in Mexico or in Central America um, is that there's um, a monopolist that is affiliated with the state. And when the Polish generals were smuggling drugs. They um, prefer to solve the case um, in their offices rather than in the streets. Um, there's often some implications of, of this competition. Um, they can arrest the employees of, of, of each other's agencies. Um, there's some reshuffle in the, in the underworld as well. Uh, but often it, it is solved um, in quite a civilized way uh, without um, any uh, dead bodies. Um, so, um, overall, uh, I think this is uh, another uh, interesting uh, point to, to have in mind. Um, I also have a confession to make, um, like, like Aliona, I'm, I'm Georgian, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Georgians have contributed disproportionately to Soviet and, and post-Soviet organized crime. When, when Soviet Union broke up, 33% of criminal leaders, so-called thieves in law, we, we are Georgian, at the same time Georgians were only 2% of the of, of, of the population of Soviet Union. Um, so I was uh, quite surprised and flattered that it's most of the criminal leaders they described as Jewish, not Georgian. Um, <laughs> even though, even though the, uh, the role of uh, Vadim Galyagin is played by a very talented Georgian actor, uh, Merab Aninidze. Uh, but uh, uh, indeed, um, uh, I also had the um, same observations about uh, uh, the uh, ethnicity um, and um, its uh, portrayal in the wrong way of what uh, Aliona and, and Mark talked about. And I will leave it there. Great. So now we can move on to questions. Uh, we will take questions three at a time. Um, so if we open up the floor now before I turn to Twitter. Just raise your hand, please. A roving mic will come to you, and if you could just give a brief introduction, name and institutional affiliation is a good start. Okay, Pete. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michael. Um, Pete Duncan. Oops, I work at CIS. 
um, teaching Russian politics and Russian foreign policy. Um, I, I think it's a great tribute to my colleagues at CIS to have organized this um, fantastic uh, panel at such so quickly and so successfully in attracting so many people. And I really want to thank all the, all the experts on the panel for their very interesting um, uh, contributions. I would also like to thank the ma makers of Map Mafia, I think we ought to say that sometime, uh, for, for the reality that they have portrayed. I mean, uh, for example, they, they, uh, w when we see the, uh, the dead, the, 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 the Boris figure, the, the Berezovsky figure um, in, the, in Map Mafia, he really does get murdered openly, whereas in uh, the way it's portrayed by the British police, he committed suicide. I don't know any Russians, really, who think that Borisovsky, um, the, the Boris figure, Bor committed uh, suicide. But um, coming to, to, to the, um, what, what Mark was saying very rightly, the word used, um, the imperceptible boundaries between uh, the crime, um, the security services, and politics, the regime which it seems to me have become uh, even more uh, imperceptible in the Putin era. And as, as uh, shown in the series with the relationship between Vadim, Vadim Kalyagin and, and the FSB. Um, is it not the case that Russian organized crime, as it does go global, it tries to colonize not just the crime worlds, but precisely the states where it is operating in, just as um, Mafia has shown the influence on the Prague police, and uh, that uh, Simeon Kleiman um, is a member in Israel, is a member of the Knesset. Um, and is it not the case that uh, the, there are tendencies in this country as well? I mean, Ayana made a very good point about uh, how when um, the police are, are, are glad that uh, Rebecca says that she moved out because she stopped liking Alex, and that the police in Britain don't like getting involved in cases dealing with Russians. They rather tend to let, would rather let the Russians getting, uh, getting on, on their own. But is that because um, there are lines from the top, the Metropolitan Police doesn't like to investigate uh, crimes among Russians because from the top they've been told that the City of London doesn't want to interfere with the activities of Russian businesses in London. It doesn't want to discourage them. It wants to keep Russians here in London, especially perhaps after, after Brexit. Or might it be the case that perhaps in some parts uh, of the police service, and in some areas, the police are actually falling directly under the influence already of Russian organized crime? And this uh, uh, certainly the connections between the, the Metropolitan Police and, uh, and organized crime was certainly has happened in the past uh, a uh, few decades in London. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Pete. I, s oh. <laughs> I see another hand over there. Michael? Hi there. Uh, my name is Murtaza Okera. Um, forgive my ignorance. I'm just an MA student. But um, <laughs> basically, I was going to say more about the informal side of things where we if we take it analytically and not take the moral lens out of it, we see inherently humans, we, we tend towards uh, personal relations, strong ties, etc. So with regards to the, the, the shadow spaces that we talk about, we, if we look into the leadership dynamics and the processes that actually, what are the critical issues for a leader to emerge in the first place is really boiling down to the system where we see the uh, the root causes of social vulnerability may be livelihoods, social protection, self-protection, or governance, um, can actually just be, hey, everybody wants to just attain a better life. So in doing so, maybe there are areas where we could potentially look into uh, to um, encourage uh, rebuilding of social or economic infrastructures where rather than seeing just the negatives of human trafficking and the status quo uh, understandings of what we think the informal economy is, um, maybe there are potential routes. So if so, uh, is there any um, works that I can look into or readings that I can look into for me to carry on my research? Thank you. Next question. If not, we can start with answering Pete's. Ah, Yuri, down here. Thank you, Yuri Tzarek. Uh, 
student here at UCLC. Uh, I have uh, two questions, if, if I may. Uh, one, uh, if we say that uh, crime, uh, organized crime is a transnational issue uh, and dealing with it on the national level is very uh, sort of inadequate to, to its nature, um, what is the way then of dealing it at transnational, international level if uh, there is such a blurred uh, border between uh, uh, crime, economy and politics, for example, in Russia, or if we say that not only the Russians are bad, but everyone else is bad, uh, not only in Russia, then in the West as well. Uh, that's one question. And another question is, um, well, w it's what do you think of uh, the way that uh, sanctions and uh, confrontation in international affairs that's been more and more deeply rooted, uh, how it affects uh, this uh, phenomena, does it favor it, uh, how it affects uh, the ways to combat uh, organized crime? Thank you. Great, thank you. Panelists, who wants to take Pete's question? Yeah, I'll have a go. Okay. Peter, I love you dearly, but I think you're very, very wrong. <laughs> um, dealing with this, with this kind of, of, of criminality is, is intrinsically very problematic and also very expensive. And it, it shouldn't, it should, the expensive side shouldn't matter, but it does matter. Um, police services have finite resources. They are constantly being told to make do, you know, make more with less. Um, and major financial crime investigations are incredibly expensive in terms of the resources that need to be thrown into them. And so you might say just as um, you know, medical systems have to make choices about where to put resources, so too does law enforcement. I really don't think that there are cabals, hints from the top, let alone sort of serious corrupt penetration. I think it's more that, firstly, I think Britain was quite badly burnt with the Litvinenko case, um, in which, you know, by definition, this, this got up the nose of the Kremlin for obvious reasons. I mean, it, this, this was not, after all, a, a, an organized crime case, but a state murder case. Um, and, and then when Britain really started to get, getting pushy about it, none of its allies did more than just simply kind of register distinct concern about the situation. Um, and, and certainly sort of Britain therefore suffered quite considerably in terms of cooperation and, and, and pressure and so forth. Um, so I think that, that, that left them a bit burnt. Um, the resource issue, and yeah, I mean, these, the, 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 the problem is this. This is not on the whole money that is then doing lots of bad stuff in the UK. It is being, well, I mean, unless you think exactly pushing up house prices in, in, in London is a bad thing, which it is, but it's not quite the same as, you know, it's not fostering drug gangs, it's not leading to sort of clear blood on the streets. It's either coming here precisely to be parked, it's coming here to, to put your, you know, put gangsters' kids into private school and everything else, or it's just rooting through on the way to somewhere else. In social harm terms, that's not a big deal. Morally, one could say, in terms of, you know, absolutely, I mean, I, I'm not for a moment saying that I think these things shouldn't be investigated. I'm just saying that in, 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 in times of scarcity, you know, do you go after drug gangs that are busy having shootouts in the streets? Or do you go after these white collar criminals who are actually very hard to nail down precisely because they're actually pretty good at what they do? Um, there, was, there was a particularly ridiculous BuzzFeed article that talked about, you know, every Russian that, that drops dead nowadays, it's, ah, well, you know, it's, 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 it's an assassination, it's a murder or whatever. Some are, some are just simply that these are fat, unhealthy people, um, you know, who, 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 who just simply die. You know, they, they, these things happen. Rather than looking for a conspiracy, I think we should look at the, the, the unfortunate fact is that f from, in Britain's, from Britain's perspective, we know the Russians do bad things, but they don't do things that are bad enough for it really to be a priority, in my opinion. Great. Who wants to take the second question? Um, well, I have a general point, actually, that has been um, in all three questions, which is about 
blurred borderlines and blurred boundaries between you know, crime and corrupt politicians, between um, politics and business, um, between um, sort of transnational and national. So, and the way in which those blurred boundaries tends to work, they work, they never would be there if we take moralist perspective, as Alex has suggested. Because if you're clear cut on what's bad and what's good, what's black, what's white, there is no issue. The problem is that life is in the gray. And it when you try to address what's in the gray, you have a lack of conceptual tools because the dichotomy of black and white does not describe it. You could not really qualify politician as corrupt or non-corrupt. Very often, you might know he is corrupt. You might have evidence that he is corrupt or testimonies of people. You could not prove it in law. What does it mean? It means that he's not corrupt, right? Or she. So, exactly. But it kind of um, comes to an invention of new intellectual discourses, such as discretion, exemptions, you know, exceptionalism, all those things which immediately install double standards. You know, so blurred boundaries are actually created by double standards, double think, double did, double motivation. You think you're doing it for the interests of your students, you really do it for yourself. You really think you're doing it for the good of your people, you're really doing it to support the stability of your regime, as some of the Russian leadership has done. So those blurred boundaries are created by those um, things which are, unfortunately, intrinsic to humans. We are always kinder to ourselves than we are to other people. If I do it, it's not corruption, it's friendship. It's helping the near and the dinner. If someone else does exactly the same, oh, that's not going to look good, right? So, and we travel between sets of standards in a very fluid way. And the whole society is resting upon that fluidity and the kind of territories which are not really clearly um, categorized. And that's what my problem is with um, the question there, which was very good about the um, human quality and, and the dynamics and you know the, the kind of the way in which systems reproduce themselves, and then you know they lock us into the choices that sometimes are not even choices at all, um, as was the case with Ludmila, right? Because when she um, accepted that job through an agency to go and work in some kind of spa, it's already sounded like not an entirely legitimate type of employment that she was seeking, which is why she got into that trouble. So there are these kind of ways in which she did need money for her mother, so she had to take that choice. And you kind of constantly engage in a level of the system made me do it strategies. At least that's what, when you talk to people, the legitimation, the narrative is always, the system made me do it. But I think you're right in the fact that, you know, when we are thinking about the developed world, the West, right, and the countries which actually provide that theoretical framework that we project to other places because you know corruption until very recently it was always there in the developing world associated with poverty and the development you know criminal rates and that was always somewhere else in fact we've done the anti-corp study um, anti-corruption um, studies project funded by the EU and there there was a media package when they looked at how corruption <coughs> is covered in nine countries and you know what's interesting, that in the UK, we've got a lot of coverage, but everything is about abroad. Nothing about the UK. 
in comparison to Italy, for example, where corruption is all about Italy and nowhere else. <laughs> so you, you have that kind of very interesting findings that show that very often, you know, we have our mental biases, you know, or unconscious kind of mental framing on subjects such as corruption and crime. And I would say, you know, one of the key things to remember about corruption that we think it takes place in poor places because of their underdevelopment. But in fact, what you see, it is because the Western world has been really parasiting on those type of territories that corruption there is reproduced. So overall, I would argue for a little bit more complexity, just as Philippa has said, a little bit of um, a thinking hat and a little bit of um, that kind of dual type of thinking and the balanced way of looking at things. Great, now on to Yuri's questions. Who would like to respond? Um, Lena? I actually, you know, when I sort of spoke about transnational crime and national, um, nationally based sanctions and the blurred boundaries, I thought that general point actually addresses that issue as well. Um, whether it helps or not, um, I think historically what we see, we see volatility. We make one mistake, like for example with a war in Georgia, right? The West decided that they want to engage with um, Russia so they wouldn't punish, or they would try to stay on the engagement sort of Perezagruska uh, button. Um, that seem to have communicated the wrong message that has, some experts would argue, has resulted in Ukraine and the situation in East Donbass. So now that we've learned that lesson, we go the other way. So it's almost like a pendulum. Um, you know, you, you over-exaggerate and one mistake aggravates and facilitates further mistakes. So what um, I've been arguing before, and I could repeat that point, is we need to see things on balance. And if we saw things on balance, what we would see is that Putin has used the Western sanctions as a pretext to introduce anti-Western sanctions that have resulted in 3.5% annual growth of agriculture that actually has made every farmer a cheese producer, which kind of created such a bias and um, you know, this sort of campaign of isolationism and you know, anti-Americanism and anti-Westernism that actually um, created more damage internationally, I think, than actually punished Putin. I think what it ha they have done, instead of trying to incentivize people to change the regime and vote against Putin, they made people support Putin, which is not good, is it? <laughs> no. Yeah, go on. I mean, also on this sanctions point, I mean, and, and, and for the record, I mean, I think the, obviously this, the sanctions are, are sort of long-term political weapons. I've never been a great fan of broad economic sanctions. I'm a very great fan of targeted sanctions on specific Russian decision makers, not that ludicrous list that, that, that came out from, from, from America recently. Um, but in terms of actually specifically how it affects sort of combating crime, I mean, there's, there's no way of getting around it that um, it has completely destroyed the basis for any law enforcement cooperation. Um, and appropriately, it gets darker as I start telling you this. Um, which, which is always, it was always problematic because frankly, Russian law enforcement cooperation was always actually an instrument in which they, they cooperated when it was convenient to them and did not when it was not. Um, but nonetheless, there they, they used to be something and now there is pretty much nothing. And in fact, I would actually sort of push it further. I mean, given that, that, that Russia is involved in, I, I will not use this ridiculous term, hybrid war, which is a totally wrong-headed term, um, but that's a 
matter for another panel on another day. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, it, it is clear that, that Russia is involved in a sort of a, a political struggle with the West in which it tries to distract and divert and, and basically, above all, divide us through all kinds of different sort of political gambits and such like. One of the things that, that we are just beginning to see, and I wouldn't want to overplay this, but I, I wrote a, a report for the um, European Council on Foreign Relations called Crimintern about this, is we're beginning to see a greater role in which actually the Russian intelligence services are looking at certain elements of Russian organized crime, ones that are specifically clearly have physical or family or other assets in Russia. In other words, where their sensitive parts are that can be squeezed by state structures. Um, and, and using them to support intelligence operations, above all in terms of raising so-called uh, Chordonaya Casa, sort of black account monies, untraceable, not connected to the Kremlin, with which they can support convenient political movements, populists, all kind of sort of divisive lunatics um, in, in, in the West. So one of my concerns is precisely that it um, is, in, is encouraging the Russians to think of weaponizing, organized crime. I mean, sorry, it all lends itself to these awful tabloid phrases. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, ultimately, that's just a price you pay when you, when you find yourself in this kind of un undeclared political struggle with a regime that is clearly unscrupulous and will use whatever instruments are available. Great, thank you. Do we have more questions in the room? Before we get to you, we have two questions from Twitter. Um, <coughs> I'm using my judgment to select ones that I think are appropriate. Uh, so the first question is from Isaac Kureshi. Isaac has said, I noticed that Boris's killers look as though they were from Central Asia. Does the panel think that this is representative of the position of Central Asian nations within the ranks of the criminal underworld? And the second question is from Brendan Thomas. Brendan says, to what extent is Russian organized crime cultivated by the state itself as a lubricant of influence? So, Alex, do you want to take the Central Asia question? Well, I think Central Asians are not as represented as Caucasians, that is Georgians and Armenians. Um, they're playing an increasingly important role uh, just because they have access to Afghanistan, and it um, gives them very significant financial power. Um, so few local civs in law have gained quite a bit of weight uh, in post-Soviet underworlds um, because of the resources that they have. Um, but overall, um, I, I, can't, I can't say that we, we should argue that Central Asians, they're either used uh, assassins that are sent abroad or um, they play an, an important role. I mean, I think it's, um, um, it's more, um, it's different than that. Um, what, what was the other question was about, uh, well, question. the influence of the states, that's, um, um, that, that's more to Marx's um, field, I guess, but, but um, I mean, w what we have seen um, is, is um, I mean, there are lots of observable implications um, uh, everywhere. Um, look at neighborhoods, at Ukraine, Georgia, or Estonia. Um, um, Russian states has been using um, organized criminals against the unfriendly regimes. Um, they have been using organized criminal activity um, as, as, um, as a tool to target the opponents um, um, in, uh, outside of the Russia. So, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, very clear. So. Okay. Um, in, in terms of <coughs> cultivated by the state, again, I think it's important to to take away some of the tabloidification. Um, I do not believe this is a mafia state. I think that's an unhelpful term. Really, what it is more is that we should note that there are Russian cops who do their jobs. There are Russian judges who do their jobs. Um, on the whole, actually, I think there is a clear improvement in the quality of Russian law enforcement. Um, <laughs> In some ways, the situation reminds me of how I imagine it must have been if you were a cop in southern Italy in the 1960s and the 1970s. You, know, you wanted to do your job, but you knew that the other guys had massive, at some point, political cover. And I don't mean Putin. I mean, I'm talking more about you know, the local mayor or the regional chief or, or the regional chief of police or, or whatever. 
Um, and therefore, you, you, you tend to you, you make compromises. Better to do something that might have an effect. Target some, some middle-ranking gangsters rather than go for the people right at the top of the structures because you know that you, know, you would get halfway through an investigation and then your phone would ring and you have a choice of basically whether you drop the case or you find yourself working on traffic. Um, so, so I think you know, actually we have to realize that this is not so much, I think, a, a regime which wants to encourage organized crime as one that you might say doesn't have a problem with it as long as it doesn't challenge the state. Because that is the one key thing that has happened. And when Putin came in, very, very clearly the message went out. You know, gangsters can be gangsters and cops will try and catch them. So long as you don't look as if you're directly challenging the state, in which case we will come down on you hard. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, even while Putin was fighting a very sort of brutal war against the Chechens, Chechen organized crime in the rest of the country, even though p people were appealing, you know, time, you know, come, come and fight and send money or help, help smuggle guns, they very quickly sort of said, oh, oh, no, this is your war, mate. Because it was made very, very clear to them that even if there was a hint that Chechen gangsters were supporting the Chechen rebels, that's when people's doors would be being kicked down with all the kind of enthusiastic overkill that this state deploys when it feels it has a threat to itself. I think that's more the issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we can move on to the two questions in the room and a third one from Twitter. Um, so while the mics get, I saw a question here, so we'll take this one first. Do we have a roving mic for down here? For this woman? Oh. Oh, we have multiple roving mics, I suppose we can, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Sasha Zirnova and I worked with uh, the clients from different Muslim backgrounds in Russia who were detained in Guantanamo. And I know that's not an issue that was covered, but um, maybe a little bit familiar with Central Asian people and the treatment. So yes, there is a stigma. So <clears throat> I want first of all to make a comment and quite positive one because we've been um, all the time talking about our subjective perception, what the series mean. So everybody sitting in the room obviously have got their own opinion, but it, nevertheless, the event was so popular and everybody came here in spite of all of their reactions. So um, I think Misha Glenny and producers of the series have done a very good job to, to create such a good series that we're all watching. Second of all, it's the art, the series. So it's the art of movies, whatever it is, cinematography. So whatever we see there is metaphor or allegory, whatever you call. So it's for each and every one of us to put two plus two together. So coming back to your point, Alona, about the lady who's sitting there, and she's the curator of political roof, Krisha, and so on. So we all are there to do all these conclusions. So we Russians obviously know what does it mean, right? Maybe it's not that clear for the British viewers, but I think it's quite actually clear on what does it mean. And the rest of the allegories throughout the series are quite clear and very, very specific. What I have is, is a question to you, panel, do you think that the series will finish showing Mac Mafia the reality, not only the Russian Mafia in the British society, but also the involvement of the police, the complicity of the financial sector, so not only Alex's firm, but all the city law firms, or KPMG, Ernst & Young, and all the rest of them. So do you think that will be shown at the end, on, in the eighth <laughs> thing, or do you think it's only about us Russians who drink lots of vodka and um, <laughs> eat caviar, and mostly, you know, black caviar, which we do not, because it's not available. <laughs> thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, uh, another question. Um, yes, the there's a guy at the back. Yes, there's a man at the back who raised his hand earlier. So while the mic is getting on the way to him, we have a question from Twitter from Siraj Paneru, who says, the UK government tells the Russian government that they don't want confrontation. Is this fact or fiction? but we're now in a position to ask the third question. Hi, I'm Ian Tudor. I was a former student at CIS. Now I'm in business, not Russian business. Um, my question is about the ethnography of um, Mafia and, and what the panel feel about that. Um, if you look at um, Vadim um, and Kleiman, they both seem to be rather cultured, educated people at the top of their organizations. They're not the, um, what, what I would perhaps imagine to be the stereotype of some kind of gangster that's got lucky and risen to the top and is sort of has a nouveau riche type lifestyle. They seem to be um, uh, cultured and educated people. Is that the truth? 
or would we rather expect people who are have risen through a hierarchy of violence <laughs> and low-level crime that have gotten to the top? Great, thank you. So the first question, who'd like to respond? Sorry? You want to collect more questions? Sure, okay. More questions, one down here, and then another here. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, panel. Um, I really liked um, Alona's uh, comment on uh, the migration of uh, these uh, mafia tasks, uh, like the change from um, decentralized uh, mafia, uh, different directions, into more um, roofing of KGB and uh, having this um, uh, previously active mafia of 90s under control uh, by Putin and KGB. So uh, is there an implication that KGB actually overtook some of the roles that mafia played before? And uh, how you can uh, maybe comment uh, on the uh, role of uh, basically the founders of uh, KGB and um, the organization of Ozero uh, in overall uh, Ma new mafia um, of Russia and also its relation to Britain, maybe since some of the some of the children of other founders actually live in London. Thank you. And the fifth question here. Hello. Um, perhaps a slightly more light-hearted question because we're talking about a TV program. Um, I tend to follow. Um, Russian politics and quite a bit and it frustrates me that in the British media I see a lot of sort of anti-Russian sentiment and not just in the tabloid media but also even in the BBC and I, I sort of I'm realizing that I read stories differently from perhaps my work colleagues and, and I see a, a sort of a bias against Russia in it so when I saw the BBC were putting on McMafia I thought well here we go it's just going to be more of the same but slightly ironically what we've actually got is Russians against Russians. And I know that my work colleagues are sort of rooting for Alex and the notion, the sort of British family, although they are actually Russian. And I wonder if the panel could say, who are the bad guys here? Because, <laughs> <laughs> because it was actually the, the Godmans that made the first blow, struck the first blow, I suspect. Great, okay, I think five is enough. So who wants to answer the first question? So on the question of do we think that uh, the, in the final episode we'll see the involvement of KPMG and Ernst and Young, I would hazard a guess at no. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe partly because my my interpretation of the show, as you guys already heard, is that it's somewhat uh, embedded in a set of um, tropes about who the bad guys are and they're the foreigners. Um, I think that, and this links a little bit to what you're saying. It is certainly true that it's Russians against Russians, but as you say, even you know they're kind of all bad a little bit, uh, um, with the possible exception of Alex, although even him. I mean, I also think you know it is. It is a more nuanced show, certainly, than I'm making it out in the sense that, you know, it's not that the Russian characters are unsympathetic, right? I mean, even Vadim in the last episode, you know, it's, we feel sympathy for him with his daughter and all the rest of it. So they're, they're not entirely cardboard cutout characters, and, and we're meant to get this sense of it's complex and it's, you know, there's all sorts of competing loyalties and things like that. But I do think it is sort of part of this... Um, as I've said, an idea with a very long history, which is that transnational crime is transnational, but somehow the only nation that's not responsible for it is us. That's sort of the, the, the history, you know, the, how this has developed historically. Um, a side note is that one, one thing that I caught in a, one of the early episodes, I think maybe it was the second one, that I thought was going to be developed more but wasn't, was that Rebecca's, if I remember, it's Rebecca's boss is the one who's the ethical capitalist, right? <laughs> and he's all about ethical capitalism. And there is, I remember, in, I think the second episode, there was a side comment where someone made, a, you know, a, a comment to her about how he had earned his money in unethical ways, and it's easy to be an ethical capitalist once you've got the money. Um, so maybe in the final episode, we'll come back to him. Excuse me, I think that would be great if we, you know, if it somehow comes, comes, you know, home to London, but I don't hold out lots of hopes. I think the whole next episode is going to be in Moscow, and there's going to be lots of 
blood and <laughs> snow and vodka and caviar right. and the whole works. That's my prediction. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, yeah, about mafia people being cultured and educated people. Um, I, I, I met quite a few, and, and I think there's also variation. Um, um, I think the older types, they, they are quite good. They're extremely smart and very educated. Well, they, they talk in a way that you, you'll never guess that they, are, they have anything to do with crime, uh, generally. Um, but there's a problem with some newcomers who have been recruited in, in past uh, years. Um, and then part, part of the problem with, with, with the demise of this traditional type of organized crime is that they have lost control over the quality of, of the um, new entrants. So they, because of the competition, competition is pushing them to incorporate more people um, um, and then a few other factors as well uh, and, um, and, and pressure from the law enforcement. So they uh, kind of lost control the, um, of the quality. Um, and, and many young people have been recruited into the ranks, um, and some of them um, not as good as, as the older ones. Um, um, so, I mean, increasingly you can see the case that um, uh, Stephen Law has been arrested because of, of, uh, of uh, stealing a uh, bottle of vodka or wine um, or, or some other petty crime, and that would never happen before. Um, so, I mean, the, the guys I've met, I mean, some, some of the people I met were in the prison, um, and, and they were not as, as, as open as, as they could be, but, but the people, um, uh, professional criminals who I met outside of the prison, they, um, and some of them have been located through social networks, through friends, uh, they were quite um, they were quite open and, and, and interesting, and they also um, uh, are quite educated. Um, so they, um, they are quoting um, uh, classics, um, you know, literature, and they are, um, telling you what, what's, they're asking you what, what's happening um, um, in, in UK, and they're informed about the politics worldwide. So, so some of them are, are, are tend to be quite, quite cultured and educated, but some are not. Well, I would say, um, to Sasha, you might be amused by a book, uh, Unmasked Corruption in the West, which is a new, relatively 2016, written by the founder of Transparency International UK, who actually takes a crusade on the corruption in the West, particularly the offshore, and um, the sports corruption, and also uh, sports-related gambling. Um, so that actually um, covers quite a bit of the top five um, that you brought up and um, might provide a good read as for whether UK, Britain, um, uh, you know, and the confrontation between the two, I must say I, I found this <laughs> very nice um, tea joke that appears in the seventh um, episode when um, the KGB counterpart tells to Alex, don't drink that tea. <laughs> I just think, you know, that joke should go viral, right, in a post-Litvinenko um, climate. And, you know, th the confrontation has been really exacerbated by um, that particular murder. But um, however confrontational the countries might become, um, and the political agenda of that confrontation is very obvious in the British press as you um, have pointed out, but there are always possibilities for back channeling. And, and I must say, you know, here the best watch is probably House of Cards, right? And the way in which there is a back channeling takes place, you know, behind um, through business channels to um, China. And I think, you know, that kind of back channeling is always open and um, that could create certain sub-political agendas that might be communicated as a kind of um, diplomatic message that um, the KGB friend of um, Vadim is uh, articulating in, in the seventh episode. Um, I would say in terms of sophistication and um, you know, educational level, um, what has been shown about Vadim and his emotional attachment to his wife, to his daughter, 
um, to his friend uh, shows sentimentality which is known in emotion in social psychology as the reverse side of cruelty. You know, sentimentality is very often um, associated with an extreme, you know, expression of um, violence. And I think that's probably what um, it's meant to um, portray in, in the movie, as well as the double standards, where you're part of the inner circle, you are given everything, and when, um, you know, it's your enemy, you're absolutely reckless, obviously denying. Um, and I don't know how you interpret that little SMS that arrived in the seventh episode, uh, which is, you know, abort mission, right? So do not kill Alex. I wonder why it suddenly uh, came, and I was just thinking, well, it came because he didn't want to spoil his daughter's birthday, right? Because he just made a speech. He just saw all those young people. He decided, okay, maybe not on her birthday. But, you know, this murders on someone's birthday is a big thing. I mean, someone who's considering PhD is a great topic because, you know, Mr. Kodarkovsky, who is now in this country, has been linked to a murder of um, mayor of Nizhny Vartovsk on, on his birthday, uh, apparently having nothing to do with it, but receiving it as a gift um, because that mayor was opposing vertical integration of the company. So you do have um, quite an interesting um, kind of... Um, range of activities uh, around uh, cemeteries, uh, youth gangs, um, graves of the uh, organized crime where you could actually see the birth rate and the uh, murder rate and you know how these things are linked. So ethnographers have got a lot to, to, to say about that and it, it's sort of promising. Um, line of inquiry if someone into that sort of um, conspiracy uh, type of thinking. Another book I wanted to recommend is uh, read um, Pilevin because what Pilevin does, he's always kind of um, half torso ahead of the agenda. Again, to Sasha's question, you know, you want to know what happens next, you know, just uh, read I fuck or whatever it's uh, called, right? Uh, the, his latest novel, uh, but it, with regard of the founders of the KGB and how they actually took control over Isai and Musa, who were the key brothers who were running, you know, the, the Moscow markets in the early 90s and had a sort of Chechen uh, mafia associated with them, there is a novel called Chisla Numbers, which kind of gives a graphic portrayal <laughs> as to how Putin's arrival has signified a new way in which KHB officers could actually take over those markets if only, you know, resting the managerial roles with the previous people, but, you know, really receiving the financial flows to the uh, Chorna Casa and, and others. So, um, anyway, who are the bad guys? I think it's a good, good question. Uh, my point being um, earlier on that good guys do not appear in this movie. You know, just somehow, you know, when you focus on something like Mac Mafia, you know, you don't want to dissipate the message. And um, in terms of Godmans and how educated they are, what their background, I think there is quite a lot that you could acquire over, um, you know, from episode to episode because the mom was a model and then happily married and educated herself, you know, on, on the go. Um, the, the second generation, of course, public school plus top university. So you do have that kind of um, social mobility, vertical mobility there, uh, which is clearly uh, is the case. But um, I would not say that Alex is a personal um, you know, sort of favorite, or that he is kind of meant as a character to cause your sympathy. Because, you know, my reading of Alex is that he's the one who shows how the tensions um, work, how loyalty to the family jeopardizes your professional career, and how 
um, you cannot really remain a professional if you are a Russian because that kind of peer pressure on being a good son first and then being a good investment banker really makes that choice really, really complex. And I think culture does come um, into it. And by the way, it's not just Russian. It's um, you know all societies that are associated with very powerful grip of kinship, where you're basically supposed to look after your elderly brothers and sending them to retirement homes, as the case might be in more developed uh, nuclear societies. Um, it, it comes with that. Just uh, two, two very brief points. First of all, in terms of the um, sort of educated, cultured sort of gangsters and in some ways an issue of social change. Um, we shouldn't assume that, that gangsters are gangsters are gangsters. Um, it changes over time, the characteristics required and, and, and the culture in question. For example, that there is this term, vori vazakonia, thieves within the law, thieves within the code, which is a kind of a traditional authority role within the Soviet underworld. Now, back in the good old days of Stalinism and the Gulag, to be a Vorda you, you know, you, you had to be demonstrated that you are absolutely committed to the common code, that you would, um, even at the cost of vicious punishment by prison guards and so forth, that you wouldn't work that you would break yourself off from society, all the whole business of tattooing and so forth. And you had to be regarded as precisely an authority figure by your peers. It was, I mean, Avorov Zakonia was not necessarily a gang leader or anything like that. He was in more in a kind of a, a high priest of this sort of secular cult um, of, of the Vorovsky Mir, the thieves' world. Nowadays, you can basically buy the title. Um, and you know, most of the people who call themselves Vori, exactly, essentially, a patron of theirs, a friend of theirs, who sort of just got, got together with, with a few mates. They did a little coronation, probably in Dubai, um, at an agreeable resort hotel. Um, and, and now suddenly, hey, I'm, I'm a Vori of Zakonia. It, it's become little more than a, a vanity plate on your car, in effect. So the title is still there, but the meaning is totally different. What once upon a time meant something now means strikingly little. Um, so, I mean, I think we, we, sh we shouldn't be surprised that in some ways we, we actually have lots of different generations who show different characteristics. Nowadays, precisely, you, you have to be savvy in the ways of, of business and politics rather than just simply the fact that, you, you know, you will eat ground glass to stop you from actually being sent out to work um, logging in the gulag. Second point is, is about the business of, of, of sort of the kick, well, KGB, I mean, it's not called the KGB anymore. Again, sorry, I'm being very pedantic. It's a variety of other alphabet soup of agencies. But the security apparatus does not, in my opinion, control organized crime. Many of them, in effect, sell protection and other services to gangsters. Many of them are also, you know, they have their own little cabals of, of corrupt and exploitative um, sort of groups. After all, when, when you have huge amounts of power, access to lots of information, and relatively little legal oversight. Why shouldn't you monetize it? I'm sure we all would. Um, we have to distinguish between organized crime and corruption. Um, it's easy to, oh, it's all, it's all mafia. Well, there, there, there are differences. This is an authoritarian kleptocracy. Um, if you look at Putin and the people around him, of course they are enriching themselves on a massive industrial scale. We might want to call that organized crime, but, but, but technically it's not. And to kind of conflate that with the, with the sort of the people traffickers or whatever is, is I think, doing us an analytic disservice. And in fact, you know, the, the, the Putins and, and the people around him, they don't have to deal with organized crime anymore. They have people who deal with people who deal with people who eventually deal with the gangsters. The gangsters are relatively low on the pecking order. The state is the biggest gang in town. The state is the biggest um, source of assets that you're trying to plunder. Quick example, Sochi Winter Olympics. Um, lots and lots of the contracts to build facilities went on incredibly feather-bedded contracts to friends of Putin, particularly the Rotenberg brothers. Um, now, in order to get those facilities built on time, it's clear that a lot of trafficked labor gangs, sort of Central Asians, were used. They were basically brought in, 
work very hard, pay very little, and then afterwards kick back to Central Asia. And that was, was often handled precisely by organized crime groups. But when you actually look at it, you know, Putin gave the contract to the Rotenbergs. The Rotenbergs subcontracted, who subcontracted, who subcontracted, who somewhere down the line ended up dealing with the gangsters. But the people at the top of the system, as I said, the, these are not people who sit down with gangsters. Maybe once upon a time, if you look at Putin in the 1990s when he was in St. Petersburg, he was basically the city mayor's office's liaison with the Tambovskaya group, one of the big networks in, in Russia. But that was a long time ago. He has now risen up the system. So I think, you know, although I'm not saying any of them are morally better than the others, I think we should distinguish between organized crime and corruption and realize that, that these are sort of Venn diagrams that overlap, but they're not the same. Okay, we have time for a last round of quick questions. Uh, the first one is from Twitter. Um, forgive me if I'm pronouncing the surname incorrectly, but from Rosalind Does. Uh, and she asks, will McMafia turn out to be a comedy, i.e. it'll end with a wedding and a dance, or will it end as a tragedy with a stage littered with bodies? Which option would reflect Mafia reality? My spin on that is how likely are we to see McMafia the musical? Um, uh, so that's the first question. Second question. Here, can we get one of the mics up there? Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Tom Warren, I'm an investigative reporter at BuzzFeed News. Um, and the <laughs> so the reason I wanted to ask my question is uh, we reported on 14 suspicious deaths in the UK and one in the US that are connected to Russia. Um, our, the report was based on hundreds of thousands of documents and interviews with 28 former and current intelligence officials. Uh, we also had readouts from classified intelligence files as part of that reporting. Uh, the stories were recently cited by the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee as well in the US, which called on both the US and UK governments to act on assassinations across the Western world. Now, given these, given these facts, is the panel concerned that UK authorities are treating uh, suspicious assassinations in the UK with sufficient rigor, especially in the fact that we've confirmed that the US has passed intelligence files to MI6 on a number of assassinations on British soil. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Yep, there's one at the back. Um, so you mentioned briefly uh, the kind of Trump-Russia allegations. Um, and I just wondered if the panel wanted to kind of comment more on that and whether the fact that, um, whether you think of the kind of collusion story, um, certainly a lot of, uh, Trump figures like Paul Manafort and Carter Page did seem to have links with these kind of informal um, <coughs> networks linked to Russia. Any more questions? Last opportunity. Yes. Hello, Kasia from BBC News. Um, question to the gentleman at the bottom. If the BBC is talking about bias in news, not obviously in drama, that's not my remit, um, I'd love to see some articles, because if we are being biased against the Russians, then I'd like to see that. Uh, in terms of just elaborating a little bit on Russian intelligence services looking at criminal activity, does that include hackers and you know, allegations against Brexit, or all that business? Would that include Russian intelligence services using criminal activity? Who wants to dive in? Oh, yep. Um, okay. I'll leave the BuzzFeed one to last. <laughs> um, how will McMathia end? I mean, if, 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 if it was reality, it would actually be that they'd all end probably happily ever after, alas. Um, but I don't think it will. Uh, in terms of, 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 of Trump Russia, um, I mean, you know, who knows quite, quite what is going to come out. Um, I mean, my, my view is that the Russians um, believe that, that there was no question but that Hillary Clinton was going to win and therefore were just trying to make sure that she inherited as problematic a position as possible. So essentially she would be too busy fighting fires to actually be able to, as they felt, engage in hybrid war and try and destabilize Russia. Um, the, the, the thing is, this is a, I mean, Russia is an incredibly uh, diffuse political and economic structure. This is not a sort of a rigidly controlled authoritarianism. It's full of political and economic entrepreneurs. You know, 
you can't basically throw a half brick in a bar in Moscow without hitting someone who's going to claim they have an inside line into the presidential administration. Um, you know, that's how you, that's how you big yourself up. And, and people like, like Carter Page, um, Manafort's a different case, but, you know, Carter Page was, was, in my opinion, I mean, just one of these sort of people who was just either taken in or actually was himself trying to talk up all, all of his contacts and so forth. Again, for me, the Trump-Russia business is just simply what it says about the ethics of Trump and the people around him. Um, and the extent to which they are willing to see that there are limits to how one makes money. Because I think this is, this, is the, this is the big issue, really. This is why you know, we, we, we have Russian dirty money and other people's dirty money. You know, and and the, the, sort of the, the, the broader question is because modern capitalism doesn't really have a clear sense of, of ethics as to where we make money. Um, in terms of, of Russian intelligence service um, hackers and so forth, absolutely. I mean, increasingly, having in the, in the noughts, it's clear that to a large extent the Russian intelligence services rely particularly on, shall we say, sort of third-party criminal hackers for most of their operations, hired or just sort of basically lent on. Um, increasingly now, they've actually set up within, well, within the, the three main intelligence services, military intelligence, GRU, FSB, Federal Intelligence Service, and Foreign Intelligence Service, SVR. All of them now have in-house um, digital intelligence uh, arms, um, some of which are precisely just simply by basically approaching hackers and saying, you could go to prison or you could come and work for us, your choice. Um, and, and we've had some, some, some cases of that. Ha but the, the, the true criminal hacker, I think, still has a role in, in the use of intelligence activities for Russia, but really is surge capacity when they suddenly need a lot more warm bodies, shall we say, to, th to throw into the fray. But the point is that the dividing lines between state hackers and criminal hackers are, again, very, very broad. And I think, you know, it, it, it will be interesting to see. I mean, I, my view is, when it comes to Brexit, if there's anything we should be looking at, it's not so much hacking, it's money. But that's, that's for others, others to look at. And finally, BuzzFeed. I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I'm not sure if you, I mean, if, if all those hundreds of thousands of documents and so forth. Um, and I'm good for the Senate for citing the report. Um, I'm still unconvinced that there is this massive array of um, genuinely sort of assassination-related killings. And particularly, I, I'm, I'm unconvinced that actually the British, the British, maybe I'm just terribly naive, but perhaps because I live out the country, I, I have this kind of fond vision of good old blighty. Um, I never really thought of myself as that kind of a patriot, but maybe that's it, I'm a born-again patriot. But I, I really don't see within the British um, government, but particularly I would say within the law enforcement and security apparatus, um, a willingness to turn a blind eye to serious cases. A lot of the, I mean, in, in, in my past, I have been, when I was working at the Foreign Office, I was a consumer of intelligence materials. And a lot of, and when people say, oh, well, we shared intelligence materials, a lot of it is actually very speculative, very partial, which doesn't really have very clear meaning. Um, we've seen this with the so-called sort of steel dossier. You know, a lot of the stuff is, 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 is very raw. So I, I, I'm not convinced yet, but I said, maybe I'm just simply naive, um, that, that there has been this, this profligate campaign of assassination within Britain, because let's be honest, there are many other countries which are so much more Russia friendly, or at least confrontation averse. You know, I really don't see, I'm half Italian, so I hope I can say this, you know, the Italian government as being one that sort of stops and says, no, 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 Russians, kill people in Britain if you want, but not on our terms. We haven't seen anything like this elsewhere. So unless Britain is uniquely um, craven about this. I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see it myself, but that's only my own personal take. I'll just ask you, this, uh, you know, um, well, I would um, say that what we discussed earlier in relationship of the political people on the top not being necessarily in touch with actual gangsters, which is easy to facilitate if you have a mediation techniques or, you know, brokers, you know, such as Alex in the movie. So effectively, that's what he becomes. 
and um, that way you are on the territory that I spoke about earlier, you know, in, in terms of legal corruption. You know, it's something that has got dual nature. You know, it is legal, but it's also feeding into illegality or crime. So that kind of notion could actually apply to the Trump-Putin question equally well. We don't necessarily see that facilitated, you know, top down, but it's, you know, happening because there are so-called semi-state agencies who <coughs> would engage on um, into hacking activities or cyber attacks, and that would effectively um, be documented. And but you could not then link them to the state <coughs> directly. So again, um, what we call Russian hackers, you know, sometimes they're not even Russians, but they are kind of, you know, branded as such, and it's easy to do because uh, Russians have always been good, you know, with um, IT, and still, you know, the, on the top sort of software, you know, the third country exporter after India and China. So you, you kind of, um, I see that, uh, yes, although Mac Mafia um, series, they're using Indian hackers, right, for, for their um, operations, not Russian ones, but maybe the guy's a Russian hacker too. I mean, h how do you know? Because it all happens <laughs> in cyberspace. And here I would like to invite you to actually look into so-called cyber informality, which is an encyclopedia. We've got quite a few entries. Um, on cyber attacks, vertical crowdsourcing, various type of techniques um, that um, semi-state agencies use. I also wanted to attract your attention to Alex's entry on war uh, zakoni and um, the uh, Georgians, mm -hmm. um, as it were. So, um, yeah, I think I'll stop here. I think we're at nine o'clock now. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you, everybody.